to. Okay, we are live now. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Burson and I'm here at the Robotics Institute as part of the Summer Scholar Program. And today we're gonna to be talking with several of alumni of the program, Anna Garcia and Seth Carton. And we're gonna talk about getting started with robotics research and explore some of the um, pathways together. So today's session, um, we're going to touch on the Summer Scholar Program, which is a specific program at Carnegie Mellon University. But we want to use this time to really um, elevate the idea of how do you get started in research and what are some of those pathways? Because for each of us, as we thought about um, exploring future careers, there's several things that we want you to know. There are ways to get started and to start exploring, preparing for a future in robotics um, wherever you are in the world at your home university. And so some of the ways that you can get started in exploring robotics are to work within the courses that you have at your home university, really to dive in deeply with that, to work with those faculty members. Is there a way that, um, whether there was a paper or, or a, a project, can you present that at a student um, conference? Can you share um, your interest with that faculty member and really start get started on um, your, your research career? Are there ways that you can compete in hackathons and competitions that you can get there? It's about, research is really about learning about um, a series of skills and, 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 and tools and research is about curiosity and there's ways to get started no matter where you are. The summer um, scholar program at um, Carnegie Mellon is a very structured approach to providing opportunities, but it's a free flowing and fluid. I think every scholar has a different experience based on the lab that they're in. And we try to create a platform in which um, you're part of Carnegie Mellon University, you're part of the Robotics Institute, um, and you're part of these labs, but you also have this no another space, and that's the Summer Scholar Program. And that's really about, um, coming together, learning, um, building skills, and we hope that you are able to build really lifelong um, connections and to help each other. We have alumni from back as far as 2010 that are still involved with uh, the program. I had the joy of having conversations on Friday about who they wanted to work with and, and different opportunities. So um, I'd like to, um, give each of my colleagues here a moment to introduce themselves. And then we're gonna hear from each of them about their research experience, about getting started in robotics and some guidance. And then we'll be taking questions through, throughout um, in YouTube and I'll be sharing um, those questions with the, my colleagues here. And about 12.30, we'll dive into a series of questions um, that you've asked to provide some additional background. So I'm gonna go just from um, left to right and um, ask each of our colleagues to introduce themselves. And that'll start with Seth, then go to Anna, and then go to Allison. And if you can share um, a quick intro of um, your home university, what you're studying, and then um, we'll go through the same direction and sharing um, the research a little bit and diving in deeper. So Seth, um, jumping off with, with, with Seth, then Al Anna, and then Allison. Seth, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm a current MS in robotics student at Carnegie Mellon University, and my research entails multi-agent decision-making. Hello everyone, um, my name is Anna and I study biomedical engineering at Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. Uh, and I'm currently an undergraduate student. Hello everyone, my name is Allison. I am a senior undergraduate student at New York University. My major is computer science and theory and mathematics. Uh, for uh, and for this summer, I participated in the RIS program, and my project is on the evaluation of automated machine learning systems. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Seth, would you like to um, share a little bit about your 
um, research experience at um, the Summer Scholar Program and also your experiences as a master's student as well um, at Carnegie Mellon. Right, yeah, so um, I previously said decision-making in uh, multi-agent teams, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, some of the work that I've done with um, some previous risk scholars uh, last summer, as well as the work that I do during my, my master's in robotics here at CMU. And that, that is uh, what I study is um, emergent communication uh, for multi-agent as well as human agent teams. Just a little background about me in case you missed it, but uh, I'm an MS student in robotics at CMU here, and I'm currently advised by Professor Katya Saikara. Uh, I previously did RIS back in 2020 with Professor Katya Saikara, and we uh, studied, uh, we explored working on um, ancient interventions where we tried to correct false beliefs between uh, humans and agent partners in order to work better together. And some of that work has inspired some of the work that I do during my master's now. Uh, and during my undergrad, I was a Rutgers student and I graduated in 2021. So to kind of motivate what goes on here in these multi-agent teams, I always like to start with this scenario, a little contrived, but it's also a little fun. It's Friday night and you're about to hop on your favorite game. Starcraft, if you've ever heard of it, it's on the right here. And you forgot one thing as you're queuing up, you're really bad. So you go ahead and you fire up your other computer and you want your AI partner from DeepMind's Alpha Star to help you out and carry you to victory. But the issue is that it's non-trivial to play alongside this AI. And it's hard to interpret what the AI is going to do. So this motivates the need for communication in these teams. If you think about human teams, especially in highly competitive environments such as esports, these people will use competitive um, shot calls in order to communicate the minimal information possible, but um, coordinate with the other humans to uh, do some play. They have a common communication language, a priori, and they're able to communicate back and forth. And that's really what the basis of my research is trying to mimic, but between uh, humans and agents. So when you think about what the agents need to do, it, first you need to be able to define some sort of message paradigm. Typically, when you think of communication with agents, you think of them sending uh, maybe encoded bits, or you can think of as a vector, a, a continuous vector encoding of some uh, latent space. And when working with humans, these messages should contain interpretable concepts that you can understand and um, be able to translate, let's say, between the the visual space or, or text space and um, some kind of natural language or some kind of encoding that the human can understand. So on the right here, we uh, consider um, another game where we have uh, in Minecraft where we have run human trials in order to um, see if humans can play alongside our AI agents in Minecraft in order to do a search and rescue, an urban search and rescue uh, task. And for example, one of if you know when when we get this working is uh, you might have um, in this top left agent here they're seeing a uh, one of our victims as well as the one of the Minecraft buddies help trying to save the victim and in this scenario it might be useful to communicate these two things represented by these numbers which correspond to the kitchen and triage which means saving the victim. Another agent may be in another area of the map and see some office-like structure. Uh, so they wanna communicate that they're in an office. And another agent may want to communicate not only where they are, like such as in a hallway, but what they're doing and where they're going. They're running to the kitchen. And this is made possible by some of our work 
that allows us to learn each of these concepts directly from the data that we need to communicate things like office, kitchen, hallway, running, triaging, so that we can maximize performance in, uh, within a neural network. But at the same time, we are able to then take this uh, symbolic representation now that we have and work with humans who work very well with these abstract concepts. Previously, uh, during RIS last year, um, I had a student who was helping me out with this. And while I led the project in, in this research, I had them explore a particular avenue with respect to trying to um, remove some of the bloated communication. So we had certain vectors that did not have information in them when they were being sent in this learned uh, reinforcement learning setup. And so one of the things that we did is we wanted to say, okay, how, when, when we do have these messages that are not very useful, how can we remove these messages or prevent them from being sent? So recognize that they are not useful messages and prevent them from being sent. Now, um, just to take a step back, and then I'm going to let Rachel get back to this. Um, I just like to think about, you know, what, what is it that we're studying when we study communication? And I talked about predefined symbols, which are manually defined. So you have to have some implicit domain knowledge. So we don't, we don't do that. You could have implicit communication where you share the entire observation. But when you work with image data and lots of agents, this doesn't scale. So what we work with is emergent communication where we're trying to have some kind of smart compression that the neural networks enable in order to, um, but, but not only a smart compression, but an interpretable smart compression so that we can work with humans as well as scale up multi-agent teams. If you have any more questions, feel free to email me at scarden at cs.cmu.edu. Thanks Seth, this is great. Um, and if someone was interested in uh, learning more about the research, they can reach out to you. Um, there's videos online, there's posters, um, but if you wanted to get a really good sense of this, uh, the breadth of work in, in Dr. Sakar's lab, what, how, how, how would you approach that? What are some suggestions that you might have um, for, for folks that are interested in taking a look at that? Right. So in, in our lab, we have a variety of projects on what we call in the multi-agent area. And so my area is one part of that, but um, we work on- um, The breadth of work in, in Dr. Sakar's lab. What? <laughs> okay, uh, we work on everything from, um, and in this multi-agent area. So if you wanted to work in decision-making, or if you wanted to work, especially on the human agent collaboration, we have many projects that are working on, so we will continue going forward with that. We have a swarm project where we have large number of agents that we're working with. And, um, and we also have projects going forward that talk about um, uh, search in these multi-agent settings. So we're trying to, um, do some sort of adaptive sampling of an environment and sample and find out what uh, key information uh, are we fi finding on, so let's say maybe um, looking for forest fires or monitoring farm crops. So we have a lot of different applications that it, you could be interested in, as well as different avenues of exploration in the multi-agent area. I, I would say that if there's something that has to do with multi-agent, uh, systems, we probably have a project going forward on that. That's wonderful. I love the questions that are coming in on YouTube and so much of about, about it, and we'll ask each of you uh, um, to, to talk a little bit about this is, how do I get started in um, robotics and robotics research and like decoding some of that? And I think each of us, as we applied for our first research experience or we're trying to dive in, um, what I love hearing from Seth is the, um, 
you know, just the complexity and the nuances that he's grasped. And this has been multiple years of exploration and building this body of knowledge. And, you know, um, so, and what is that starting point? We have some colleagues joining us from um, um, different areas in the world and, and, and some specifically talking about they're, 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 they're coming from countries in Europe where their exposure opportunities for undergraduate research come much later, like almost at the end. So what are some tips and, and ideas there? So I'll um, share some of those questions with each of you um, in, in a few minutes, but Anna, would you like to share a little bit about your um, um, research experiences and getting started as well. Of course. Um, so I was a part of RIS 2022. This is a small picture of this 2022 cohort um, that I was uh, very honored to share the summer with. And during the course of the summer, I was able to work with Sam, a PhD student, and the professor James McCann and Melissa Horta Martinez, and creating a robotic loom to teach mathematics, physics, and mechanics. So this is a multidisciplinary project where a lot of uh, different skills got involved to use this robotic loom to teach an undergraduate course about physics, mechanics, and mathematics. So I contributed mostly on the mechanical part of this loop. So during the, during the summer, we built this small prototype of 40 threads uh, in which I contributed on this blue, uh, lettered scheme, which is the tensioning system. So basically what this room let what this loom lets you do is that you're building it as you go through the course, through your classes, right? So you start assembling the loom from scratch and you also program it and you also thread each single yarn through every single stage here. So if you can see, there are 40 of this little uh, slots down here, uh, which go through the different tensioning stages. And in the end, uh, you get to this warp beam where you can actually program and you get to program the motor heddles over here to create uh, patterns for, for your thread. So in here, mostly what I worked on during the summer was 3D modeling, assembling, and here are some of the components, of the main components of the tensioning system. Uh, one of them is a very crucial stage, which is this one right here, which is a tensioning disc, uh, which actually compresses the yarn as it goes through. And this little disc goes inside this little case bobbin holder with an arrow. Um, that allows the thread to go up to this little stage and then up again and then through the motor heddles. It sounds a little bit complicated, but uh, once you start assembling and once you start doing it yourself, it becomes a little bit easier. And the whole purpose of doing this in separate stages is so that when the students started assembling, they could evaluate what was happening in each of these tensioning stages. So first we have uh, station A, which is like the winding and storage station where each student gets to put their own yarn and screw it in and pull it out. So it's a very dynamic situation. And here there's nothing um, mathematically going on. But after that, you get to the first uh, tensioning system, which is an additive tensioning system. Uh, which is basically those two discs, small disc uh, compressing uh, through a string. And then you thread the string through that and you get to understand how this tension is affecting your yarn. So eventually, uh, thanks to the normal force and the tension in your spring is that you get this equation. Afterwards, you pass through 
The final tensioning stage, which is a multiplicate tensioning system, which is basically just a shaft through which the yarn goes over. And it's equal to this equation, thanks to the normal force, which then gives you a final model, a final model for your tensioning system. And this is just a very small part of what was the bigger loom, which is this one. And it was very interesting throughout the summer to learn about how how important tensioning is to form a, a good pattern. And it sounds a little bit uh, weird to think that help you do something very, very creative like a yarn pattern, uh, which is all made through matrices and uh, algebra. And it was a very interesting process to work through all that. And in my uh, well, I contributed by making this part of the tension system. So what was that like coming here, Anna? Um, this was one of this was your first experience this past summer um, at Carnegie Mellon and in Pittsburgh. What was that like to come here for the first time? It was definitely eye-opening. Um, at least in Mexico, there's a different approach towards research. Uh, so it was new to hear about how research works over here uh, to be able to work in such in creative projects. Um, and especially having that interaction with a lot of international students to navigate through research. Uh, so it was a very, very helpful experience uh, to help me realize and what skills I could, I had to work on to build a strong article, to build a strong poster, to build a strong application. So that was very, very helpful for me. And um, we hope that the paper, the poster, the video, that these are going to be things that you're going to be able to use to open future doors. And, and, and that's one of the goals. And so one of the things that uh, Anna mentioned here is that the deliverables or outcomes is that it's this collaborative process. I think we had students from 13 different home countries last year, which was awesome that we all came together. Um, we were able to spend that time here in, in, in Pittsburgh. And the, the RI community is very international and global as well. Um, and so it's really interactive. People are coming with different backgrounds and exposure. And it's not as often that um, there are some peer institutions that have amazing undergraduate research, but um, many of the students coming in, this is more of um, one of your earlier exposures. So your course experience, um, um, hackathons, competitions, everything that's built skill sets, you could bring this together and um, working across the community is really um, important to do so. I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Allison Yang, to talk about her experience with the um, Summer Scholar Program this last, past summer. Allison? Uh, okay, hello, uh, I'm Allison, and uh, let me share my screen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so for this summer and the following semester, my work is focused on the evaluation of automated machine learning systems. Uh, I evaluate the machine learning systems on open ML tasks. So uh, let's begin. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to post some advertisement on our amazing Autumn Lab. So in, in, in this lab, we aim to address the limitations of AI science and practice. We focus on some domain-specific problems like in healthcare, natural science, robotics, uh, security, and time theory intelligence. And we also aim to improve the accessibility and facility the adoption of AI technology. And this is um, a part of what I am working on, the auto ML, automated machine learning systems. Uh, so uh, what is an automated machine learning system? Uh, it's com uh, this system just uh, can automate the search of plausible pipelines to address the shortage of qualified data scientists. 
Uh, an auto ML pipeline include data pre-processing, visualization, hyperparameter tuning, and model selection steps. And an automated machine learning system con consists of many such pipelines in the in search space. Uh, what it want to do is to uh, just f identify the like pipelines with uh, good performances and return them and rank them on its leaderboard. Uh, currently, there are multiple automation systems available. For example, our AutoLab is uh, developing an automation system called AutoML. Uh, and we have also some other automation systems available uh, for commercial use. And my work uh, is just uh, co consists of several research questions. How well does the AutoML system developed by AutoLab compare to other AutoML frameworks? And what's the performance of AutoML systems under different time budgets? And what's the performance of AutoML systems under different data characteristics? So we selected five AutoML systems, AutoML, H2, AutoML, Teapot, AutoGlow, and AutoSecular. We selected 183 OpenML regression tasks. And we split each OpenML data set into training and testing data sets. We feed the training data sets into each automobile as the inputs. Uh, and uh, this data sets training data is used to uh, train the model and the automobile will automatically run the pipelines in its search space. And the testing data uh, is, uh, uh, is used to test the top pipeline, the number one pipeline returned by each automobile system. We use R square as a performance evaluation metric. We also set up three experiments in parallel with different time budgets. So we have the following results. We just uh, rank the automatic systems to observe their performance. And we can have several conclusions over here. Uh, we can see that except for the uh, blue one, the H2 automobile system, uh, which is a trailing automobile system. The performance of all other four automobile systems are relatively closer to each other. And we can also see that when the time budget increases, the gap uh, in the performance between different automobile systems just get narrowed down. Uh, when the time budget is really slow, like in 60 seconds, uh, the gap between them is rather high, but here they are slow. And we can see, uh, also see that the teapot, uh, which is denoted by the green dots, uh, just get the top one place over raw time budgets, uh, which indicates that the teapot auto ML might be a promising auto ML system. Uh, and we also uh, instigated into the training and testing discrepancies. Uh, here, we, the, uh, we, we just uh, do a scatter plot and uh, this is the uh, ideal line. We want the dots to be as close to this diagonal, diagonal line as possible, which uh, because this line indicates that the training performance and the testing performance of the auto ML are uh, very close to each other, which makes the prediction of this auto ML on its training data is very reasonable and be easier to generalize to unseen testing data. Uh, but we can see over here the uh, correlation between the training and testing predictions of all the autonomous systems is not very good. Uh, it's just less than 0 0.5. So perhaps this is one aspect that the automated machine learning systems need to work to improve. Uh, and here we also do some uh, time separated training testing discrepancies. The process is basically very similar to the previous one, but we just uh, plot, plot the, uh, do each plot for each time budget. Uh, so the plot is over here and we can see there are might be like small variations when the time budget changes. Uh, yeah, so, and one interesting conclusion is that for H2 automobile, the testing and the train correlation is weak. The time budget is small, but increases significantly to a 
rather large value, the entire budget is large. Like here, it only has 0 0.08, and here 0 0.15, and here 0 0.56. So this is an interesting observation. Uh, we also do some uh, investigation regarding the performance with data set characteristics. We focus on the performance of the auto systems with the dimensionality and number of instances of data sets. Uh, and we can see over this plot that uh, H2 auto is still the chilling auto systems uh, overall, like uh, dimensionality of data sets and number of instances. But one drawback of our investigation here is that our selection of data set is highly uh, uneven. Like we have many data sets with low dimensionality and small number of instances, but we have relatively few of them uh, with higher dimensionality and higher, uh, larger number of instances. So, uh, which makes that the plots and conclusions over here may not that representative because of too too few of the data sets. So this this, this leads to a future work is uh, over here. Uh, I just like to incorporate more data sets and diversify the choice of data sets to obtain a more comprehensive view of the performance of autonomous systems. We not only need the autonomous system with low dimensionality and number of instances, but as well as uh, the data sets with high dimensionality and number of instances. And another focus of our work now is to explore possible weight assignment with good performances for ensemble models. Because due to pre previous exploration, we kind of find the ensemble techniques rather effective compared to the traditional uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. So we also did a few began our work in building such ensemble models. Like over here, I just, uh, tried some random with assignment across the pipelines. We just let the pipelines in the auto, <coughs> sorry. We just let the uh, pipelines in the auto system to vote and to uh, take the different ways assigned to different pipelines. But now the example model does not have a very good performance, but uh, we should be able to find the optimal with assignment. We can be relatively promising. So this is a focus of our future work. And for any questions or suggestions, feel free to contact me at my email over here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Allison. That was wonderful. The Auton Lab is an amazing group. And um, there's a lot of examples of the, what's striking me is that there's a lot of examples of you know, scholars that have come through um, various labs and continued on there. And that's one of the questions that came up. Um, I dropped a doc in the, uh, in the chat there so we could uh, answer some of the questions that are coming in. Yeah, sure. Um, kick it off for, for each of you. There are um, students right now that are thinking of like, I may or may not have the experience. Um, I may not be ready for um, research. And I think each of us, as we think about different opportunities, it was only, I think the, <clears throat> I went on a fellowship um, to Germany in 2021. And as I was looking at the call for, for, for um, applications for that, I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Just do it, right? Just, you know, put your materials together. Um, the, they're, they're looking for, um, you don't need to have publications, you, you know, use your course information, find other ways to share what you, your knowledge, and each of you is an expert more than anyone in doing this, and so I, I wonder if you might um, share your, your, your guidance in really forming the strongest um, application possible and um, some of the next steps. How would you approach this? How would you approach this? And opening that question up and, and the others to, and to all of you. Sure, I could uh, start us off. 
Um, I think that there are really two aspects that make a strong application. And it's it's really one aspect, but if you if you if you knew if it's nuanced enough, it's two. Where the first is interest. And by interest, I don't just mean like, wow, I really like robotics, because I mean that's good too. But you want your interest to be, you know, academic in nature. What do you like about robotics? Oh, I like robot manipulation. I like um I like multi-agent decision making. Okay. So you have a particular area in mind uh, that you would want to work in. And in, in addition to that, you want to have some sort of understanding of the field. The the people that are successful in getting into the program typically have some ideas or at least some interests or areas that they want to explore. I want to be able to use a robot arm to pick up um you know, maybe a soft, uh, you know, a non uh object, like, um, sorry, a, like a, a foldable object, like a napkin. I've seen people who have like very, not specific, but they have an open problem in mind that they would want to approach. And the other item is that you want to have some sort of previous experience that will show us that um, you know what you're talking about. So this could be coursework um, where you do a project and you have a project for your class. And the project not only um, is something that like went over exactly what the professor told you, but perhaps you went a little above and beyond and you said, oh, I added this extra feature or I was really interested in exploring this area or I, um, added all this extra code to it or perhaps so they could do all these other features. It, the, the idea is to show that you personally are contributing to some pro project. You know, it could be in class, this could be um, on your own. If you have a project where you're doing research at a university, but in another area, that could be useful too. When you have it in combination with the first element that I said, which is the interest, because that's always the most important. If you're coming to risk, you want to do robotics or, you know, things that are robotics adjacent. I guess also adding a little bit to that part of the projects, I guess a lot of people think, oh, I need to have like a big robotics competition in order for it to be strong. But most of the time, that's not the case. Um, I guess I share the thought that it is just a project that you are very passionate about and then you added something more and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a big robotics competition it just has to be uh, a project that you put a lot of effort into uh, and how you made that project work right and I guess I think also what happens a lot is that there's so much stuff out there that sometimes is very, very uh, complicated if you don't have like a specific passion yet to focus just on one. And I found that it's very helpful to read about the faculty members that are uh, in risk, to read about their work, to see if you're interested, you might be interested in what they do here or not, uh, because that also can help you build a very strong application based on the work that it's already being done here. You don't have to come up with uh, this new major way of making robotics. Uh, it's a very great way to start building on the people, the amazing people in robotics that are already at CMU and RIS. Uh, yeah, and from my perspective, um, always very curious about how was I selected because I'm not the type of guy who possesses like uh, lots of papers in top conference. Uh, but I did do lots of research uh, on the past projects of the uh, labs in Carnegie Mellon University. So I think that'd be kind of helpful. Uh, for example, when I was writing my essay, I just... Uh, um, just indicate some of my past research experience in related fields and to uh, also highlight the connections between my past experience and the work they've done in uh, the labs uh, of our uh, robotic institute. Uh, like I just raised a few questions and I stated that I'm 
always curious about these questions. And I think, okay, by participating in this project, I can find the answer to them. And I can also uh, contribute to this project by uh, using and uh, applying my past experience uh, accrued from some, some project. So I just um, highlight the alignment between interests. I think my, that my kind of key off. Another thing I wanted to add is that if you do have experience in research at your home and university, you really need to talk about what you'll get here at Carnegie Mellon, you know, what from a risk experience that you wouldn't get already. Because if you're already researching um, robot manipulation, let's say, uh, and you would be doing the exact same thing during RIS uh, at the lab, um, that's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking to help people explore into new research avenues. So if you have, let's say, robot manipulation research experience, or maybe a project, but you wanted to get into um, uh, multi-agent decision-making, let's say, uh, and, and you have some interest and maybe you've uh, have some like ideas or you've read about the area and that's why you're interested. Uh, that That's what we're looking for. In this program, we're trying to expose people to as much, many different types of robotics as possible. So don't think that you need to have any publications. I don't think I've heard of people who have publications at the point of entering risk. That might be overqualified for what we're looking for. We're trying to give people the um, knowledge and experience necessary so they could possibly get into that first publication range. So another question that we have uh, is, who should we ask to write a letter of recommendation for research experiences? Now, as you probably have already heard us talk about, um, just to start us off, uh, the people that know you the best is who you should ask in terms of professors. So you want to ask a professor because they will have, um, you know, experience writing a letter of recommendation. They've had to ask for many in the past, so don't feel bad about asking them. But you don't want to have someone who you just did well in a class with. You want someone who, a professor who you went to office hours and you ask them questions so they know you. You want a professor who um, maybe advised your course project. Uh, for a class and you um, have, or perhaps have had discussion outside of class and you talk to them about things. Um, the idea is to try to form some sort of, um, you know, bonds with the people that you work with because that's how you learn more. And we're looking for people who are looking to go above and beyond in terms of trying to learn for outside the classroom experiences. Uh, any other thoughts, Anna or Allison, on this before we go to the next question? I oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, regarding the choice of the person who writes a letter of recommendation, uh, when I was applying for the risk program, I asked two professors, but uh, actually they were professors that um, to uh, whose lab, uh, courses I've taken. Um, there were some course projects. Um, yeah, but um, I, I know that if you simply take a course of some professor and ask them for a recommendation, that's not a very strong recommendation, but um, for that two professors, I did impress them in some way. Um, just uh, although uh, I only participate in some in their class, uh, I also did the course projects, and I just top rank, and they will remember my name well. So uh, if you have to choose a professor, uh, the, the interaction between you you. Uh, it's only you participated in his or her class. Perhaps you can choose such a professor that you believe that you do you did impress them very well. Uh, if it's not such professor, um, I would recommend you just uh, come to us to ask for a recommendation letter from a research uh, professor. To uh, yeah, so I would not bother to ask a professor. Uh, to write me a recommendation letter uh, simply because I obtained an A 
but there are, should be more something more than that. I also agree that on some level, we are looking for some experience regarding robotics area. So I believe that one of the uh, one of the requests during your application is for one of the professors to be from uh, science area, mathematicals area, but uh, it's not required specifically. And while it's good to have a professor advocate for your skills regarding mathematics, computer science, um, or any of those skills related, it is important to also have the letter from a professor who knows what your skills are during class, right? How, how do you write? How do you uh, perform? How much do you, that really knows how you perform in other ways, not necessarily specifically just your knowledge about mathematics or your grades specifically. In my case, I got a letter of recommendation from a math professor and from a uh, human science professor. But I think in both cases, both professors were able to see different parts of uh, the things that I could add to the project that weren't necessarily uh, computer science. They were also related to how much your writing skills or how much you put into a project. So I think you don't have to close your mind to just ask uh, a specific department for letters of recommendation and mostly focus on a professor that really knows you and that could see could enhance those parts of you in a letter of recommendation. Okay, so I think we have uh, one more question that we haven't covered. Um, now, the question asked a little about our history. What was the our, the risk scholars' first experience of robotics research? Um, would anyone like to start? Uh, perhaps, perhaps I can start then. Um, so in terms of first experience, so during my undergraduate uh, degree, I, when I was at Rutgers, I, my first experience of doing research was um, of doing robotics research was with uh, some underwater robotics. So I was doing some um, localization, simultaneous localization and mapping for underwater robots. And I got involved in this um, through how you might get involved. I had no research background. I had barely any coursework at the point, but I was interested. So I was reading about robotics a lot and I was reading about the challenges in the field. And I knew what, would, what sounded interesting to me. Uh, and what sounded interesting to me at the time was being able to coordinate these multiple water, robots underwater with SLAM. And so um, on one of my university websites, they had positions open that you that professors were looking for students. And so it was simple as writing an email and talking about my interest in robotics from there. And this is very similar, I think, to what the risk application is, um, maybe on a less personal level, because uh, the interview stage is a later stage, but um, if any, uh, but but here it's the same type of questions. You know, what what are you interested in doing? Why are you interested in doing it? And what um, what ideas do you have? How much do you know about this area? People are really looking. They're not they're not looking to um, reject you. They're looking to admit you. They're trying to give you reasons to admit you. So you need to talk about things that are interesting in respect to what they're working on. So, you know, if you are applying to work with a certain person, you should know everything about some of the papers that they've recently published. Um, though they might not be working in that exact area anymore, the ideas from those papers and the methodology is going to be used in later work that they have. I can go next. <laughs> uh my part uh my first approach to robotics in general was in high school through first robotics and that's where it started to get a little bit more uh interesting and aimed towards research but since it's more 
for a competition, it wasn't that much. It wasn't. It had that much impact towards a career in research, but it gave me that first uh, encounter with robotics, and it wasn't until, I guess, uh, my second year in in my major where I actually started to <laughs> get more interested in research. And that's how I found RITS. I, I didn't have any research projects before that. I didn't have um, any papers or publications. And it was really that interest in driving, finding a way of complementing what I'm studying with robotics that led me to RITS. Uh, yeah, and for me, uh, my experience of robotic research is more uh, like research on artificial intelligence because I was uh, less engaged in the actual building of the robot. Uh, robot. Uh, so uh, it begins, uh, began when I was uh, engaged in a full-time internship of five months. Uh, I, have, I had much flexible time at then, so I just um, randomly read some books and found that um, one book in AI just particularly attracted my interest. And I found that I was super fantastic about the AI concepts, like the uh, like the mathematic stuff and the inference uh, and the planning and the agents and the games. Uh, I just like this concept so much. So after that, I formally took the artificial intelligence class as well as the machine learning class in in my school. Before that, I was always self-learning actually to begin with. And after that, I formally take some, took some classes and um, finished some course projects um, in AI and machine learning, but still very mathematic. Uh, and after uh, the uh, accumulation of these two courses, I used the uh, uh, experience of the course projects in these two classes to apply for the risk program. Uh, and I was very lucky to be selected. Uh, so like my first experience uh, with robotic research is not, um, it's just rather simple. It's just begin uh, pure from myself, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, one additional thing is that uh, for this summer when I visit Anna's lab, and because Anna has uh, been doing much stuff uh, in building actual robotics, and I just think that, okay, but Anna's lab is so amazing with so many machines that I never seen before. But in my lab, there is only laptops because I'm always doing some mathematics stuff. <laughs> yeah. I think it's also very important to say that there's like a lot of phases to robotics and like, getting into robotics that doesn't necessarily have to be building them or programming them. So yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah there are some like uh, different or distinguished sub areas below the uh, overall robotics, but both of them are amazing, I think. <laughs> Yeah, we do emphasize to have like as much collaboration and involvement between labs as possible when you're a rich student here to try to meet some of the other scholars and learn about their research as well. So there's definitely opportunity for great networking in this program. And I still know people and I actually even run into people. I'm like, oh, you you also did RIS. Uh, so lots of people who who do RIS go on to um, become master's students or PhD students and other programs here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, visiting researchers, etc. Um, so I think that's all for our questions. If, if you guys have any other uh, pieces of advice before we wrap up, um, chime in. I guess it's a very uh, good opportunity to share that uh, there's an Instagram for C for RIS theme you that you can follow where there's going to be updates on how you can apply, uh, recommendations, testimonies from other scholars. So if you're still interested in looking for that, you can look for the Instagram. I'm going to share.
can I share the screen real quick to show? Here's the Instagram. And right now you can see that we posted some of our latest scholars for 2022. And you can read more about their research, what they did during the summer and some fun facts, some of the social events that we had also during the summer. And I think it's a very good opportunity to read about all the labs that we can work at and what other scholars have been doing. Okay. Uh, thanks, Allison and Anna. Um, and thank you again, Rachel, for putting this together. Uh, we'll be ending the session now. Um, if you have more questions, feel free to email us afterwards in um, to follow up. Otherwise, uh, uh, good luck with your applications. And I encourage you to apply. Definitely don't be the one to self-reject yourself. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.